Neuroscientist Dr. Elena Serenova wants to push the boundaries of aging and is focused on living for as long as humanly possible. Last week, we heard how she's developed through her supplements business, NMN Bio, a natural nootropics mix to help boost and preserve brain health. Today, in part two of our interview, we're gonna hear about her longevity lifestyle, from diet and exercise to her supplements regimen, including, as her business name suggests, NMN, and she shares a little known skincare secret too. I'm Claire Johnston, a journalist on a mission to learn how to age well, look and feel good for longer, and to share what I discover with you. I do that right here on the Honest channel and on my website, honest.scott. Scroll down to the bottom of any page on my website and sign up for my newsletter, and you'll automatically be entered into my monthly giveaway with some great products up for grabs each month. But now, let's hear from neuroscientist Dr. Elena Serenova about the longevity lifestyle she hopes will extend her life and health span. Well, I think that brings me neatly on to um, biohacking in general and um, your particular regime, you know, exercise, sleep, diet, supplements. So. Um, let's start with the supplements. How many did you say you were taking again? Uh, probably around 30. Because I think it was 25 last time. It's up. 25, 30. To be honest, there are quite a few supplements that I am um, I might be cycling during the year. So at any mm. particular time, it's probably around 25, 30. But, you know, sometimes it could be 35. So, for example, for bone health, I would cycle chondroitin, glucosamine, MSM and other supplements a couple of times a year, maybe. And then I would cycle um, kelp for uh, iodine as well, mm -hmm. like uh, maybe once or twice a year for thyroid health. And then I would, of course, have my baseline supplements that I would cycle here and there. I would cycle melatonin as well a couple of times a year because um, besides the sleep effects, it also has a very potent um, antioxidant um, action in the brain. This is very, very good for your brain to cycle it in, in small dosages, right? So, and again, you know, this goes back to people abusing it sometimes and they take some crazy dosages, some, you know, like 10, 20 mg of melatonin like where are you going with this you know so you can measure your sleep and then you would see if you're cycling just small dosages of melatonin 0.5 1 2 mg uh for a month let's say you will be fine but if you start increasing the dosage 3 5 10 20 mg of melatonin like you will be getting some deep sleep, but then you cut it off and then, you know, it's all, it's all crop. Like it, it's going to help. Basically, you're not getting any more deep sleep naturally because the brain just uh, gets unused to this. And then with regards to my supplement regime, the baselines uh, are probably the ones that um, I chose to launch, you know, through NMN Bio, because I think those are the most uh, important supplements for us to take. And then another one that I absolutely love um, is here. So Wild Alaskan Fish Oil uh, by a company called Wiley's Finest. So I'm not affiliated with the company. I don't get paid to promote them, but this is like an absolute favorite, especially this one, the Peak EPA. Um, amazing product. And they have another one as well, which is in liquid form, which is, uh, I think it has lime flavor and it's absolutely Ooh, amazing. that better be a strong lime flavor. <laughs> it is, it is. Yeah, they do mostly, Fish oil. Um, they the fish oil quite well. And the um, interesting part here is that when you take fish oil and you open the bottle and it like you open it and it smells so bad, it's like the, the fishy mm. smell is so strong, mm. it's probably oxidized already. And when you have polyunsaturated fats that are oxidized, it's no good for you. It's um, They're going to do more harm than good to, to your phospholipid brain, uh, brain layer. Can I ask why you take the fish oil rather than just eating a lot of oily fish? Uh, I'm not uh, a fan of fish in general. Okay. So I actually have like quite high standards for fish because I grew up in sunny Greece in a in a little, uh, you know, seaside hometown where, you know, our be practically, you know, like family friend slash neighbor would go fishing in the morning and then I would have the fresh tuna for lunch. And this kind of fish... Like it has nothing to do with the can that you would find in the in the grocery store or even in like most restaurants. Mm -hmm. So my uh, standards for for fish are super super high. But this is actually a good point because if you are consuming a lot of something 
uh, in your food, you actually don't need to supplement. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. you know, most of our foods, they wouldn't be as nutritious today. And, you know, this goes back to uh, processed foods and whatnot. And having nutrient dense foods such as meats or organ meats even. And for me, again, I don't like the taste of most organ meats, so I don't consume them. But what I take is desiccated beef liver in a capsule, which is the absolutely amazing uh, multivitamin coming from nature. And it's like, if it's desiccated properly and it's frozen and like the nutrients are being preserved. And again, I'm not affiliated with any brand and I'm not going to recommend any brand, but there are, there are quite a few brands out there Supplement. Not one I'd heard of before. That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not taking um, a conventional multivitamin for this reason, because I'm taking the uh, the beef liver on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I can I can list your uh, basics um, in in the description, so we don't have to to cover them. But um, what else? What else is in your mix? Yeah, well, of course, you know, like the number one supplement is the NMN, right? And yeah, I'm, I'm putting that into your basic stack there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, the NMN, the berberine with milk thistle, because mm -hmm. we like the reason why it's so important. Even if I'm on a low uh, carbohydrate diet, I still want to offset the natural insulin resistance that is rising in my body because I do consume carbs every now and then. So then. I have to offset this. So nutrient sensitivity is actually one of the hallmarks of aging as well. So it all goes back to aging well, longevity lifestyle, and being very conscious about what is going on in your body. What are the processes that are going on in your body? And therefore, this is a very important supplement to take. So we become less nutrient sensitive as we age. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and we're just that, not processing them. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. And, making, and we also yeah. are becoming more insulin resistant specifically for insulin, like this is going on, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So the quercetin, again, is another supplement that I'm taking every now and then. So I'm taking it maybe five days a month. It also has like a very powerful anti-inflammatory effect. So right now I'm actually fighting off a cold. So I'm taking a lot of quercetin. And with that, I'm actually uh, taking a lot of vitamin C, which is another incredible biohack that I recommend to everyone because vitamin C is very cheap. Everyone can uh, have access to it. And when you're about to get a cold, if you actually megadose in the um, realm of two, three, four grams um, a day, you can probably go up to eight grams a day, but this is not a medical advice, right? And everyone should consult with their doctor first, but it can offset inflammation in a very, very efficient manner. Um, so it's a wonderful supplement to take when, whenever you're sick, you have some inflammation going on, congestion and so on. Yeah, so that's the other one. Okay, let's see. There is the uh, the vitamin D um, with vitamin K2 that I'm usually taking, which has undeniable benefits for, uh, you know, for longevity, for your skin, for your bones, for everything, pretty much. I'm not taking collagen. Um, because I take the NMN and NMN activates the collagen production pathway. I hardly do any procedures for my face. I might do like a facial massage or a hydrofacial maybe once or twice a year and that's it. And that would be just because I happen to be in a spa and that's about it. And then it's all about good organic natural skincare. And then the supplementation, because if you can maintain the cellular function from within, you actually don't need a lot of interventions, right? You know what? I recently interviewed a microbiome specialist. It was absolutely fascinating because I've, I've I had um, really cut down on skincare over the last year just on what I hear, obviously, from speaking with experts, but also just, I think, a kind of instinctual um this can't be good for my skin biome and um so now i kind of cycle i do something a little bit similar to you with supplements i do that a little bit with skincare as well i tend to sort of cycle so that some days i'm really only just putting on a an oil has antioxidants and omega fatty acids you know kind of lightweight oil um but I don't want to completely miss out on all the fun. So uh, I'll use vitamin A, um, a retinoid just a couple of times a week. And, um, you know, that's more or less what I'm doing. I'm just now washing with water and I've really scaled it back and facial massage, I, red light, that kind of thing. But 
it's incredible how, you know, the fear is as you age, doing less like that is a bad thing. But it's yeah. quite interesting how I think my skin has improved uh, from doing that. So I'm not stopping everything, but I'm yeah. just, I'm, I'm going for kind of minimal rather than maximum. Because I also think when you go to extremes, that's when the trouble starts. And it's the same with supplements, I think. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, we talked about biohacking, but what about bioharming, you know, because when you start having all these interventions and your whole life revolves around them and you actually like forget why you started doing it in the first place, like it's not a very healthy approach either, yeah. you know, whether it's um, multiple skincare uh, treatments that you're doing or something else. And, you know, I actually have another example here, which is, which I find very funny, right? So, so, you know, Brian Johnson, the um, longevity influencer. Yes, so, I do. <laughs> he's, he's an interesting one. Absolutely. So, so he's doing great in terms of uh, longevity awareness. And, you know, we're like, I think we should all be grateful to him because mm -hmm. of what he does, right? Because he doesn't have to do that. And, you know, this is just his passion project, basically. You know, when it comes to uh, the extremes that he's going to, let's say he's talking about, okay, well, I'm always sleeping alone. <laughs> so my question is like, why are you even doing it? So you want to live forever to sleep alone forever? Yeah. Like, and loneliness is a killer. Yeah, loneliness yeah, and absolutely. isolation absolutely. are some of the least yes. healthy things that you can get involved in. I'm one of these crazy people that also says that I want to live forever too. Like I wouldn't mind living forever. But if I was to sleep by myself my whole life, like, man, like, why are we doing this? Yeah. Yeah, I also think that um, biohackers serve a good pur purpose in society. They're pushing boundaries, they're raising awareness. Um, but I think that life has got to be worth living and there's got to be joy and there's got to be purpose. And, you know, it's, it's really about maintaining a natural weight and eating real foods. And I think if you're eating real foods, you're exercising, you are happy, you're joyful, you have a purpose, which is not tearing other people down. I mean, you can't go far wrong. And the rest is just fine tuning. So I, I know you um, have an animal based diet, which I really want to talk to you about as well, just to understand what that looks like in a day for you and why. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of um, of investigating myself, of exploring myself, different diets. And throughout my lifespan, I actually have experimented with pretty much all of them, right? So like 10 years ago, I was a vegan for some time. And then a couple of books came into my life, as I said, back in 2019, when I started the low carb diet, because I realized, well, it looks like, um, you know, our diet is the best for the human body when it's actually physiologically relevant. So what does this even mean is that like, what are the foods that we evolved eating and why are we eating them? And to make sure that first there is no, um, there, there is no processed ingredients in there. And also there is no damage that is being done. And this is naturally what led me to a low carb diet. I mean, I was all, already not eating a lot of processed food, but then I realized, okay, seed oils and all this stuff, like I don't need them in my body. They don't serve a purpose. It looks like carbohydrates also don't serve a specific purpose. It's not that I'm uh, at a zero carb diet at the moment. I have two meals a day. And for autophagy purposes, I am having, um, I'm doing intermittent fasting every day uh, for around um, maybe 20 hours of fasting and a four hour eating window in which I have two meals. So how does my day look like? So um, I wake up and I take some of my supplements like the NMN and the TMG and all this stuff. And then I have a block of deep work where uh, people are usually still not uh, awake actually, because I am an early riser. So I wake up around 5, 6 a.m. naturally. Whatever decision-making uh, I need to do, or I want to do some scientific reading, I'm going to do it in the morning. And then uh, I'm trying to actually 
uh, follow my natural rhythms, right? So I, I'm listening to my body and circadian rhythms are actually very important to this. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there are chronotypes, there are different chronotypes that we have. So some people are naturally early risers and this is basically engraved in their genes. So I'm one of those people. And they uh, there is actually two categories. So the one is the lark, which is myself, which is the ultra early riser before 7 a.m. And then there are people that wake up around 7, 8 a.m. naturally. This is a different chronotype. Mm -hmm. And then there is, you know, like the night owls and all this stuff. So, so the night owls are naturally more alert in the uh, in the evening, and there is nothing you can do about it, you know. And sometimes these two categories of people, the early people and um, you know the night owls, like uh, marry each other, <laughs> <laughs> never see each other. Yeah. Anyway, um, so so I wake up in the morning, and then uh, I usually go to the gym around nine ten a.m. and I do my exercise. So I'm either doing some cardio or I'm doing some resistance training or some uh, a PT session. I sometimes do kickboxing and boxing and all this stuff, which is good for strength and muscle maintenance and all this stuff. Um, and then after that, I have my first meal of the day around eleven twelve. Uh, which is my breakfast, which would uh, consist of just a bit of fiber to ma maintain the microbiome that is responsible for digesting both fiber and carbohydrates, just in case I want to have some carbohydrates, right? So I'm doing like usually like the most convenient thing here to do because I'm optimizing everything in my life for convenience and for efficiency. Like I just do a few cherry tomatoes because I don't need to cut them. I just wash them and then... Ah, so you're not entirely animal based. That's that's the interesting first point. You are you are. There is a bit of fiber, yeah. There is a mm -hmm. bit of fiber there, and then my meal, my first meal, would be usually an omelet with maybe some meat, um, maybe some leftover steak from from the previous day, maybe, and and then some cheese, and that's about it. Maybe a bit of yogurt every now and then. Um, so this is my first meal, which is, you know, protein, fat, and just a bit of fiber. And then my second meal of the day would be um, high protein, high fat. So this would usually be a steak or some, some other meat, and I can alternate between different meats. And then depending on the day of the month, because I'm a woman and my hormones are changing du during the month, maybe I will have a sugar craving. And because I'm taking all my supplements, the NMN and the berberine, I don't have them anymore, but... I will probably have them like once a month, you know, because everything in my blood is just, you know, Sugar like craving once good. a month. Yeah, I, yeah, I do. I do. Can that be me? <laughs> so, so that's usually the the second main meal, and then I would choose whatever I want to have for a carbohydrate every once in a while, and this is my nutrition at home. And then maybe I would have, I would misbehave a bit more if I'm going out for a meal. I'm very comfortable with the intermittent fasting. So I don't like having, uh, you know, late dinners and whatnot. And unfortunately, my friends are not the same, although I'm converting them now. <laughs> to eat earlier. Oh, I hate a late dinner. Going to bed with food in my stomach. And, oh, yeah, I don't yeah. like that. And what I realized is that when I want to meet someone for a meal, I don't have to tell them let's meet for dinner. What I'm telling them is let's meet for late lunch around 3 p.m. Is that okay with you? And then for me, it's the dinner. <laughs> I see what you did there. What I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. And now I'm I'm kind of, you know, brainwashing my friends and basically about the sequence of foods and things like that. Whenever they want to have some carbs, I'm like, no, 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 let's have the fiber first. Let's have just a bit of like a salad. And then we have the main meal and then you have the carbs, you know, and now they start adhering to it. And this is just so rewarding to watch. And because, yeah. you know, they're losing weight, they're feeling better, better metabolism, better body composition as well, which is very uh, important, uh, both for longevity and for for overall health, really, right? Because there is an optimal range of body fat that you can have um, either as a man or a woman, like those, um, those percentages are different for the two genders because uh, the female needs to preserve the fertility, right? So for example, for the female hormones, you don't want to go too low on body fat and you don't want to go too, too high on the body fat. But yeah, this is like towards the lean range, which is probably uh, related more to longevity because in all longevity studies that we're seeing like in animals and whatnot, um, lean animals always, always, always live longer than animals with higher percentage of body fat. So this is important. But again, here the, the caveat is that you want to preserve um, the body fat percentage that 
will allow you to also preserve the optimal reproductive hormones because if you're going too low then you're going to start uh, like being infertile basically i think that for me it's very important to maintain consistent exercise for sure because we need to preserve our muscles as mm. we age because like when the muscles start deteriorating and we get sarcopenia uh, sarcopenia it's hard for us to preserve bone density because then the bones are not being supported by our muscles so then it's again a cascade of negative reactions so we want to said that as well. So super, super important. And here, if we start this uh, this consistency and this intervention earlier in our 30s, let's say, you know, you're going to do so much better in your 40s and 50s because you're not yeah. going to lose mobility as fast, right? So I wish I'd known. I wish I'd had all this in my 30s and 40s. You know, I've, I've arrived at this quite late. So, um, yeah. but still, you, you know what, starting, starting out exercising for real in my 50s, lifting weights, um, yeah. you feel the strength coming back and it, yeah. it it takes years off you in terms of how you feel physically. It's incredible. So, you know, it's, it's worth starting at any age. Yeah, absolutely. The best time to start is always now. It's fascinating. I am extra fascinated because I do eat some, some meat. I'm a natural eater. I, I eat natural things. And... Um, I avoid the refined grains and that kind of thing, but I eat whole grains. I don't eat a lot of gluten because my son is celiac. I think that helps me. I mean, I'm Scottish. I've got, sorry, the oats are staying. <laughs> In Scotland, we're all for the oats. Berries, nuts, salads. Um, and I... I love them. That That's like the fruit of my life, really. And so it interests me because there's so much data behind heavy plant-based diet, plant-based fibers, you know, as you talked about them lining our stomachs, I can see you shaking your head already. I mean, I'm somebody who's going to stick with the plants because I just love them. And, and I have to follow my instinct and my and my joy and also, my, you know, my health. I'm, I'm, I'm 51. I'm touching every kind of wood surface available, but I'm doing okay. Um, why are you not? Why are you shaking your head at me? Tell me now. <laughs> so you don't have to exclude all the fiber and all the carbs. Oh, good. I'm glad. I thought you were going to tell me I had to stop. <laughs> No, no, no. So I think it's very important, as we previously said, to actually have a sequence in your food. So this is the number one super simple free biohack that I would urge everyone to to actually apply, right? Because let's say you want to have your oats, you want to have your um, whatever carbohydrates it is, just have some, a small amount of fiber first, and then maybe even wait for a few minutes for it to coat your gut. And mm -hmm. then you proceed into the oats and something else, right? Yeah, so I and don't some know fats if with it as well. Yeah, and, and oats go together, but but like this is my personal hack, right? Maybe you can find something which has fiber, no sugar, no carbohydrate, so no fruit, but something else, like preferably just a bit of vegetable of whatever type, right? And you consume this, and then after that, you can consume, you know like something else, right? Like I was going to say, you can consume anything you want, but like, don't do that. <laughs> well, this is where the glucose revolution. And I think, you know, you mentioned it and I would urge every viewer. I mean, she's, she's huge now. Um, glucose goddess on Instagram, follow that. Um, you know, she has done so much to educate people around insulin resistance and, um, but th there are some really simple tips in there. It's all in the book. It's really easy to follow. And yeah. at Glucose Goddess on Instagram. Um, yeah, that's what we're talking about here, really, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's super important to do that because real food, nutritious food, is actually, it's not sweet, mm -hmm. you know? And it, it's definitely not as sweet as, you know, like some pastries and desserts and things like that. And this is completely unnatural for our body to process. And this is why we're going into all these processes that we described uh, earlier with the insulin resistance and the uh, damage to your arteries and all these things. So if you can just minimize this damage and mm. still have something sweet or something containing carbohydrate every now and then, like that's a win-win for me. Like this is great, right? Yeah. Because you still like, you don't have to exclude, you don't have to go zero carbs. You just need to be mindful. And then for me, 
I I really like asking myself, okay, why am I having this right now? Why am I consuming this? And mm-hmm. I think that again, like this is our responsibility to uh, educate ourselves and to do this because I think that our purpose in life is um is not only to to be a consumer, right? It's to also make an impact and to give back either to the world through what we're doing through, through you know, our profession, but also to give back to the people that we love and have amazing experiences with them and to experience this world in a in a way where we make an impact. In, in order to be selfless and do this, you actually need to be selfish first and you need to optimize yourself and you need to set up boundaries with, you know, processed foods in your life and you need to make sure that you know what actually i'm uh, like i can be the best version of myself and what do i need to do in order to achieve this and i need to go to sleep when my genes want it people uh you know um talk about the 4 a.m club and this and that but actually no like 30 percent of population is night owls so Mm -hmm. it's impossible for them to do it it's impossible for them to go to sleep early it's not impossible for me and it's working quite well but it's not for everyone so we then need to discover what is the best what are the best foods for us as well because you know like there are people that are saying that they're doing very well on a vegan diet. As a scientist, I think it's inevitable that they will be having some amino acid deficiencies. Um, But another factor here, which is quite personalized actually is, you know, like what is our microbiome? How is it reacting to the different amount of amounts of fiber? Yes, I think I think um, I can recognize the too many pulses and vegetables in one pot can sometimes have a downside for me. I love this because um, I, well, I want to ask you quickly something about NMN before we finish, but I think that's such a, a, a nice rounded note really about, you know, purpose and service and things that are just incredibly important to a meaningful life. A meaningful life, I think, will will much more likely be a longer life because we have meaning and purpose. Um, but I'm also glad that we can agree around um, what suits you best, you know, following your instinct about what foods serve you best, as long as they're real foods, we're trying to cut out the processed stuff, cut out the sugar if we can, as much as we can. Um, these are the things that are going to serve us best and not sort of arguing over how much steak you should have in a week. And, you know, it's, it's something we can work out for ourselves and we, we don't have to, to fight about. So I think that's a lovely note there. Um I wanted to ask about NMN uh, because, you know, I, I still take it. My family take it. I, I had a doctor on, Dr. Brad Stanfield. He used to take it. He stopped taking it. He said the human evidence isn't there in the human studies. Um, I wonder where you think we are now because it's also, of course, that, that balance between, well, why, why bother taking NMN if it's sort of broken down in the digestive system? Why not just, just take another... Um, form of b vitamin you know and and be done with it what what's your take now with where we are with the evidence yeah absolutely so this is a great question and actually you know there is so so much information and misinformation out there and obviously you know when when you're not a scientist yourself like you don't know what to believe right and there, there's been you know a few a few naysayers for for nmn recently and so what's happening with nmn and the current human clinical studies like i find it very interesting that there are some things that are basically very robust and don't even get mentioned right so for example there is a video saying that look it does uh it is safe it does raise the nad in the blood but it doesn't raise it in the muscle right so oh there is no evidence for this so how do we know that it's working right so the thing is that what is the output that we're measuring and what are we trying to achieve because the th- like NAD is being rapidly metabolized in tissues where it's utilized the most. So when we're measuring NAD in the muscle, this is not an indication that an NAD boosters like NMN don't work. This could be an indication of actually it's being rapidly metabolized because this is where it's being utilized, right? So this is a very well-known fact that there are some uh, molecules in particular tissues where they have a rapid turnover and then we basically cannot measure them, right? So this is what we're talking about with regards to dopamine and uh, monoamine oxidase that is metabolized in it. So if you would have measured it, 
um, if it was possible to measure it in vivo in the human brain, you wouldn't spot any dopamine either, but there could be huge and huge amounts going through this process with a rapid turnover that you can't really measure, right? So this is, this is point number one from some of the studies. So I'm actually concerned about the output of the studies and, and the aims and the objectives and how the studies are designed, because there is also you know, the different dosages that are being tested. There are many clinical studies that are testing at quite a high, quite a low dosage of NMN. So for example, 200, 250 mg, and then they would say, yeah, well, there was no overall effect, but actually we know that NMN is safe in human clinical studies up to 1.2 grams a day. I know many biohackers that are taking more than that actually. So basically what we're seeing with different studies is that, um, some people pick and choose different benefits of NMN and pick and choose the results as well. And interestingly, I watched a few videos of the NMN naysayers that are comparing this human clinical studies, and not every one single video has reported on the benefit of the collagen production pathway because the evidence is actually robust because it's a measurement on an mRNA level uh, of it's an mRNA expression measurement of the different genes that are um, that are showing you whether the uh, the collagen production pathway is activated in the cell or not. So none of, none of the influencers has actually commented on this. So th this I found strange. Well, you're going through all the benefits and you're going through all the papers and all the clinical studies, and you already have commented on the particular clinical study, which was in pre-diabetic women. Why didn't you comment on this, right? And then, you know- you Can we link that? Can you send me that and I'll link it for people to look at themselves? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's the study um, in pre-diabetic women about insulin sensitivity. And I understand that actually when it comes to different anti-aging benefits, we might not even have the proper output that could be measured because when we're talking about um, you know, the the output that NAD has on different processes like inflammation, for example, because our anti-inflammatory response is also NAD dependent, right? So it's implicated in, in, in how our uh, body is actually fighting inflammation. If you take NMN, after a surgery, your recovery will be sped up so much. And I had the opportunity to actually experience this myself because I had a dental surgery. They opened up my gum. So there was a lot of inflammation, like my whole uh, face was swollen. And then for the first two days, I wasn't taking any of my supplements. So I was only taking the anti-inflammatory and the antibiotics that they gave me. And then on the third day, I introduced the NMN. And within a day, like my whole face got unswollen. Like it was so interesting how yeah. this happened, right? So there, there are different things that you can measure. And then there are studies showing that it may or may not have statistically significant effects in terms of uh, grip strength. There is one study that is showing it, but a couple more are not showing it. But again, like what do we pick and choose here? Because we need to kind of ask ourselves, why are we supplementing with NMN at all? And with regards to the efficiency, this is undeniable. So it does boost NAD levels in one single step. It's a very efficient precursor that convents into NAD in the blood within 15 to 60 minutes. So rapid mechanism of action, very bioavailable. The reason why we take it orally is because the transporter that transports NMN into the cell is highly expressed in the gut. So this is also undeniable. And then um, the next question for us is, why do we do this at all? Because uh -huh. we know what NAD does. We know that it sits on the Krebs cycle and it helps you produce NTP. And then this basically fuels so many cellular reactions, including the DNA repair, including the sirtuin activation. There was a study that wanted to see if there is an effect on sleep, right? And then they found at the end, there was no effect on sleep. But actually, if you look at the study, very poorly designed. So you have uh, some people taking NMN in the morning and in the afternoon, but why would you take the NMN in the afternoon if you know that actually you take the NMN, it boosts your NAD levels, and then 15 hours later, it uh, helps your body start spiking the melatonin production. So you know that this is a supplement that you take in the morning, and then they just analyze all these different groups and say, oh, no, we didn't find any effect on sleep quality. Yeah, of course you didn't. Like, why did you do it like this? Like I mean, we have continued using it in my family. My, my dad has... Um experienced significant results really with it in terms of his arthritis and energy. My sister, her arthritis has improved. She has more energy. And now my husband, 
who doesn't like to be convinced, he likes to make his own mind up on things and he edits all my videos and it's all going in. Well, he's taking it now as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of the few things that he takes. Inflammation is an NAD dependent process. And mm -hmm. that's the reason why you're seeing improvement in rheumatoid arthritis, in uh, autoimmune disease. And if you go to Trustpilot and you read the reviews from Adam and Bio, there are so many amazing, like heartwarming reviews that I keep on seeing. My autoimmune disease is gone, right? I'm not tired anymore. The science is there. We know that you replenish the NAD levels, you can produce more ATP, your mitochondrial function is getting improved. So it's all there, right? Mm. So uh, the thing is that when are we going to, um, you know, to see the data on multiple indications? But for me, the uh, benefits of NMN are undeniable. Sneaky, sneaky final question. Skincare, you mentioned you, you kind of stick pretty natural. Well, I have, I have a... Um, a secret. <laughs> oh, secrets. And it's cheap and it's accessible. And oh, they're and different. Accessible. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a dragon fruit extract. So dragon fruit extract is actually super, super good for your skin, is super potent and super high in antioxidants and other ingredients. There is there is a cheap um, tonic lotion that I use from Sephora. It's literally, you know, under 10 quid. I don't know how much is it, like three quid or something. And it's just absolutely remarkable for your skin, right? Dragon so that's fruit. I'm going to, I'm going to find it. I'm going to link to it. Oh, I mean, you know, we have an internal team that is constantly researching different compounds for different supplements. So what happened is that we were looking into the compound and the potential anti-aging effects, and then we realized that actually, no, we're not going to put it into a supplement because the most potent application is for skin. Dragon fruit, number one compound. There might be other products out there that I haven't just searched up yet that are high quality dragon fruit for acne and, and things like that. You know, there are a lot of women are struggling with this or even pigmentation. I think that this actually comes from nutrition because when you cut off carbs, you know, like acne goes away. It's mm. very, like the effect is very profound. There are a couple of very nice products with vitamin C as well um, for skincare, for sure. And do you avoid uh, retinoids or do you use them? I do, like I would, I don't remember when was the last time I did a retinoid um, product, maybe like a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, there is a new one that is called Nutinol, N E W. Okay. Uh, it's a Korean brand. I don't know what it is, but it's basically a retinoid analog and it's not as harsh on the skin. So I've been using that as well. Uh, very good product. I'll try to find the link. I'll I'll, I'll try yeah. to, to send you all, all of those links. Yeah, but retinoids, I'm not doing much or I would just, again, cycle maybe once a year just for a few applications. But yeah. I remember last time I tried it, I like my skin didn't like it. So I kind of stopped using those, although I used to to use them in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's so much to come around that and um, what balance looks like using using some of these stronger actives, because um, I'm sure they have their value. It's just uh, like everything. We can overdo it with them and we don't quite know what that looks like. But um, I always say, they, you know, our skin tells us if it's dry, then yeah. scale it back. Yeah. OK, well, thank you so much. I mean, I could just literally talk to you all day until you're through. You literally ran out. <laughs> Of, um, of voice, but I'm not going to do that to you. Thank you so much. I hope you feel better soon as well. Thank you, Clara. Thank you for having me. So what do you think of Dr. Elena's longevity routine? Personally, I'm focused on health span. And for me, that's about eating a diet that's very low in processed foods, eating mainly natural whole foods, trying to balance my blood sugar, working out with weights and staying active, getting plenty of sleep and taking a few key supplements, including NMN, but being careful around dosages and frequency until we have significantly more research from longer term trials. But what does a longevity lifestyle mean to you? Or maybe you're still trying to figure it all out. And if it all feels just a bit overwhelming, focusing on the basics will go a long way. If you want to support the channel, you can give this video a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, then by subscribing and hitting the notification bell, you won't miss future videos from me. For now, thanks for being here and I'll see you next time. Bye.